Imagine a homeless man with that homeless man smell, with his, those filthy fingers, those homeless man fingernails, and he's wearing a coat, and he has some blankets on that he found, and has some torn up shoes, maybe he's pushing around a shopping cart, and he maybe has some gloves, this, like one glove or something. And he's sifting through trash bins for food, and, he, and he'll eat things that you won't even touch. And imagine he has all sorts of diseases and pathologies that makes it painful for him to walk, or maybe he's hunched over, or, or he has something about him that you can tell that's really, you know, some sort of physical pathology that has gone untreated. And so he's, he's, he's semi-crippled. Or better yet, imagine that he has a kid. Or, or best yet, imagine that this person is a kid. Imagine the most helpless and the, and the most needful person that you can see. Should this person be given medical services, or food, or housing, or clothes? And should the state force others to pay for it? Which is what this really, this question is really asking. Because a tax is not a suggestion. All taxes are violently enforced. So should people be forced to pay for this person's quote-unquote basic needs to be met. To be met on the threat of being thrown into a cage or shot if they resist persistently. If your answer is yes, that they should be forced to on, under the, this death threat, then what if this poor person that we're, that we're talking about didn't exist? Should people be forced to provide housing, schooling, medical services, food, etc. to this person who does not exist? Of course not. It's only by coming into existence that they then are owed. Now, everyone is someone else's kids. Two people chose to have a kid, and this kid came into existence. Humans are what happens when two people have unprotect unprotected sex. That's it. And at some point in this offspring's life, he became desperately poor. And by simply coming into existence, this person is said to be owed things. So by two people having a kid, this somehow creates an obligation in you to pay for their kid. And because everyone is someone's kid, all welfare programs is a form of child support. It's other people getting you to take care of their kids. Whether or not you want to pay for the less fortunate, that's a personal decision on your part. But the logic behind state socialism, that is involuntary and taxed and forced, uh, is that groups which have the most kids and don't have the resources to raise them properly, uh, is that they will be subsidized. In a democratic state, one person equals one vote. So a family with 10 kids in a small house, poorly and scarcely raised, well, that will become 10 votes. A family with two kids, intensively raised, that will become two votes. The small family, by being wealthy and responsible, is punished and fined in the form of progressive taxation and has less control over the state than the large family whose behavior is subsidized at the expense of the small wealthy family because the, because the, the money's coming from them to the larger family. But we can't just let people die, can we? Because if we let people die, like people died for most of human history, and like most animals die all the time, then... then... then imagine if we prevented all the gazelle in the savanna from dying. Fairness, 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 fairness. Africa's population has gone from under 250 million in 1950 to over a billion today. So what? Are Africans deserving of four times as much stuff as they were in 1950 because they've quadrupled their number? Before you concern yourself about letting people die, why don't we take a look at where the populations are growing the most? Dogs cry. So should all people be forced to give dogs the necessities of life? Dogs dream. Dogs feel pain. Dogs suffer like you and me. And so do pigs. 
Should all pigs and all dogs be entitled to universal health care? Why not? They're sentient. They feel. Now, maybe you can have a group where everyone gets what are called the basic needs taken care of. You know, that sounds like a nice thing, like a nice fraternal society. Uh, the problem comes when you have millions of strangers and you have groups with different reproductive strategies. And so we see that a welfare state benefits the mass reproduction strategy because the welfare state won't let kids die. And a democratic state favors it as well because each person is one vote with no consideration given to the quality of the person. Ooh, I said that. The quality of the person. Right. Like we say, the quality of the cow, the quality of the pig, the, the quality of the fish, the quality of the car. We will say, that person is of low quality. Maybe socialism of a sort can work within homogeneous groups with similar birth rates. Units of 150 to 250 people who know each other. Dunbar's number, the prime unit. Maybe. And that's all voluntary. Most importantly, people can opt out. They can opt out. If families that pump out 10 kids start jumping into the, into the welfare pool, I want out. I want out. I'm not subsidizing their behavior. Babies are not valued equally at birth. From the Economist article, Discount Babies, quote, the paper finds the cost of adopting a black baby needs to be $38,000 lower than the cost of a white baby in order to make the parents indifferent to race. Boys will need to cost $16,000 less than girls. Is that repugnant to you? Why should it be? Does the higher value of whites and females seem wrong to you? Is it repugnant that adopting a dog is orders of magnitudes cheaper than adopting a human of any type? In fall 2004, uh, the average cow cost about 1500 and the average um, black market baby cost anywhere from $60,000 to $120,000, depending on gender and race. We differentiate the value of animals. Why is differentiation of value among humans so taboo? It's as though there is this magic threshold where we go from the animal world where we differentiate and have no qualms about saying this is more than this and then we go to the human world and the human world is flat. Once you cross that threshold, all equal. And it's completely arbitrary and it's completely sentimental. And it's obviously sentimental because it's humans that are doing this. Alexander the Great kept his pet tiger in better living conditions than his troops. Why? Because Alexander valued that cat more than he valued any one of his soldiers. And he wasn't constrained by these modern notions of, of human, all humans being more valuable than all animals or, or, or anything like that. Attacks on peasants in the Middle Ages were treated as a multiple of an attack on cattle. Like if you killed a lord's peasant, that was about the same as killing ten of his cattle, and you could reimburse him with some money. And with that money, the lord can then go buy another peasant to replace. People are not equally capable as adults, and they're not of equal potential at birth, and they're not valued equally at birth, uh, types of people are not valued equally any more than types of fruit are valued equally. Are they of equal moral worth in some moral sense? Well, I don't want to get into some big thing on, on what is morality. But if we determine someone's moral worth by their actions, and, and I'm just going to go with some colloquial understanding of what is a moral and immoral action, then certainly not. And, it, of course, it, it's absurd to, to judge someone's moral worth by anything other than their actions. And I'm not even going to defend that. I'm just going to assert that. The levels of criminality and sociopathy are more and more being inferred to have genetic causes. Of course, at birth, a person hasn't yet committed these acts. So we could say that moral inequality is just a probability in the beginning which may or may not manifest in action, but is more likely to manifest in some people, and probabilistically is more likely to manifest in individuals of certain races than others. 
in reality, we don't value people equally. It's only when the dogma is out in the open that people go against their normal behavior patterns and are overridden by that dogma of equality. How about equality before the law? Certainly we must value equality before the law. Well, actually, this is another lie. Firstly, foreigners are treated differently than citizens in, very, in every country on the planet, so, I mean, that's wrong. Um, but more importantly, in less formal law, law is not equally, even, even in formal state law, it's not equally applied. And I'll just put it this way. If you're my friend and I catch you stealing, I'll be mad and I may try to fix you and get to the bottom of why you're trying to steal from me. But if you're a stranger and I, can, and I know I can get away with it, I'll just blow you away. Because I don't care about you. I really fucking don't. I don't care about your issues. I don't care about your, your history that led you to this desperate act. I don't care about any of that. You're just an object. And I'm probably a bit extreme in this stance. But nobody applies the rules equally to, other, to everyone, unless the dogma is presented. And by that I mean a teacher will enforce the rules more harshly on, on the students she doesn't like, and be more lenient for the students she does like. But as soon as the other students call her out on it, she'll probably be more equitable in order to, to what? To enforce the rules equally. Why? Because that's what you're supposed to do? But on what basis did those students call the teacher out? Why is the teacher obligated to enforce the law equally on all students? And it's said to be some great crime to have double standards in the enforcement of law. And for most of human history, they didn't, there was no equality under the law. This is a modern invention, a recent construction. How about equal opportunity? Oh, we've got to have equal opportunity. Why? If one man acquires for himself a great amount of wealth and another man doesn't, are we to say the wealthy man owes the poor man? Now what if the rich man wanted to give all of his money away to some stranger? Let's say Bill Gates wants to give all of his money away to some stranger. Would we deny the rich man from doing that? No, of course not. He wants to give it away to some guy, whatever. But when he wants to give all of his money to his son, oh, then that's a crime. This is the illogic and the hypocrisy, and it only makes sense in a mind embedded in this egalitarian democratic thought. I don't think it really so much as makes sense as much as it's not even analyzed. Now, just because it's dogma doesn't mean it's wrong, but it does mean that all this will be irrationally defended. I implore people to go down into the equality assumption, into the egalitarian democratic mindset, and look at it. Look at all of these beliefs that you have that you don't even recognize as beliefs. You just see them as the way things are and, the, and what is to be valued. You know, equality before the law is valued. Why? There's no basis for that. It's just sentiment. It's just subjective agreement. Where did this come from? Why do you believe it? Now, this is not to say that we should go back to feudalism, but that again is, what is animal farming but a form of feudalism? How different is animal far farming from enslaving black humans? It's just a matter of degree. Black male humans are worth about 40 times as much as a cow, and white female humans are worth about 80 times as much as a cow. And this is not to say one should be cruel to others just for the heck of it. It is merely to say that modern egalitarianism is a revolt against nature. It's an, assert, it's an absurd assumption whose principles lead to absurd policies. It leads to people thinking that the world is full of great unfairness and results in people ceding more power to the state to correct these perceived injustices. The market is cosmically fair.